Good morning, church. Let's stand and worship together today. When darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken And my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Our shame, our shame no longer has a place to hide. I am not a captive to the lies. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. Oh, I won't be shaken. Yeah, I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I. Stand a chance when I stand in your love. Well, there's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out a grave. There's resurrection power that can sing. There's power. The power in your name My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love Yes. Get excited. Make some noise. Yes. Yes. Hey, it's good to be excited when you're in the house of the Lord with each other, right? Worshiping together. And so I want to greet you. Welcome to Montrose Church. Those online, thanks for joining us. And it's good to see you guys. How's everybody doing? Are we doing okay? Hello. It's all right. Um, so, we're going to continue in worship, but first, I would love for you guys to turn to your neighbor and greet them. Say hello, and um, anything like that. Go ahead. Ask him. Sing this together, your love is devoted. Your love is devoted. Like a ring of solid gold. Like a vow that is tested. Like a covenant of old. Your love is enduring. Through the winter rain. And beyond the horizon. With mercy for today, faithful you have been, faithful you will be, 
you pledge yourself to me it's why i sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips You father the orphan. Well, you father the orphan. And your kindness makes us whole. And you shoulder our weakness. And your strength becomes our own. And now you're making me like you. And clothing me in white. Bringing beauty from ashes, but you will have your bride free of all her guilt and rid of all her shame and know my her true name. And it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips you will be praised you will be praised with angels and saints we sing worthy are you lord you will be praised you will be praised with angels and saints we sing worthy are you lord and it's why i sing your praise will ever be on my lips
think this morning about an area of your life that needs God's breath breathed into it. An area of your life that feels like it's dying. Maybe it's a marriage. Maybe it's finances. Maybe it's a sickness. I don't know. An area that just feels like it needs God's breath breathing new life into it. invite you to let God into that space. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, pour out our praise, it's your breath. In our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you. Only it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. Pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs, 
Church, would you pray with me? Gracious God, thank you so much for this morning. And God, just like Eric was saying, we just want to sit in a space this morning where we're open, we're reflective, where we need your breath and your Holy Spirit to sweep in and make something new. A fresh perspective and energy. Would your Holy Spirit sweep in, God, and give us confidence to be the people that we've been created to be through you, God. God, thank you so much for everyone in this room and the people watching online. Thank you that they've chosen um, to be a part of the church today and worship together um, and learn and open up your word. And we're excited to continue the Unblock series, and Dave's going to bring a great thing this morning. And so prepare our hearts for that. And God, everyone here who's brought something heavy with them this morning, would you be with them? Would you wrap your arms of grace and love around them and help them know that they are not alone? You are with them and we are with them as well. God, thank you for all you're doing in this service. Thank you for this wonderful worship time. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hello. Hello. Um, we had a little bit of mic difficulties, but we're back. No worries. Yeah, you guys can sit. Sorry. They, hey, I don't even have to say anything. You guys know the drill. It's like, okay, so yeah. Um, I don't have a ton of announcements, um, but we do have the Right Now page, which you guys know is our vir virtual bulletin. It's really handy, really cool, um, super easy. So if you, you can take a picture of that, or you can just go to MontroseChurch.org um, slash right now. And it has all the stuff that's going on. It has um, the sermon notes. It has the scriptures. It's just, it's incredible. And some things on there, kids musical is going on Wednesday night for kids. Um, we have youth events, junior high and um, high school for Wednesday. And we also have a ton of groups and life groups for all of you, of all ages, everyone. So um, check those things out. It's important to get into a group, I think, um, calling us to a little bit more. And so uh, we have some great opportunities for those things. And there's some new ones starting. I think we had an awesome one start last week with uh, Melanie Brzezinski, which is really cool. And so those things are going. Um, anything else, bro? I think I'm good. All right. Um, let me pray real quick for our tithes and offerings. And thank you so much for your giving, guys. God, thanks again for this morning. Thank you for your tithes and offerings. And um, just thank you for the, the gifts. And would all the gifts go to the furthering of your kingdom. Jesus, we love you. Amen. Come out of sadness from wherever you've been. Come broken hearted, let rescue begin. Come find your mercy, O oh sinner, come kneel. This earth has no sorrow, the heaven can heal. The earth has no sorrow, the heaven can heal. So lay down your burden. Lay down your shame And all who are broken Lift up your face Oh, wanderer, come home You're not too far so lay down your hurt, lay down your heart, come as you are. Well, there's hope for the hopeless, and all those who've strayed, come sit at the table, come taste the grace. There's a rest for the weary, a rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow, 
that heaven can cure. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame, and all who are broken, lift up your face. Oh, wanderer, come home. You're not too far. So lay down your hurt. Lay down your heart. Come as you are. Come as you are. There's joy for the morning, O oh, sinner, be still. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can hear. The earth has no sorrow that heaven can hear. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. And all who are broken, leave them your face. Oh, wanderer, come home. You're not too far. So lay down your hurt, lay down your heart. Come as you are. Come as you are, come as you are, come as you are. Amen. It's a good, it's a good thought, isn't it? Come as you are. We don't, generally. Maybe that's good. Mostly we come as we think we ought to be, or like we want to be. Not always like we are. Kind of taped up, you know. Ace bandages wrapped around our head and heart and sliding in. How you doing? Good. Real good. Real, real good. Real good. Ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. Are you? Are you asking? Are you seeking? Are you knocking? Because life has a way of taken the asking and the seeking and the knocking right out of you. Yes. It has a way of getting you more into the, I'll just survive. I'm going to hang on. I'm in a hanging on mode. Not so much asking, seeking. Asking, seeking, knocking, that reflects some sort of optimism. Yes. Some kind of, you know, desire for what's next. And the last, well, life. But the last 20 months, probably especially, has, has tried to take away our asking, seeking, knocking. It's turned us into something else. I don't know what. You can fill in the blank. I'm more of a blank than I was 20 months ago. Yeah, more of a something. Cynic. Skeptic. Ezekiel was a young man who was on his way to the priesthood. He was living in Jerusalem. He had a bright future ahead of him. In fact, at the age of 30, he was going to enter formally into the priesthood. But at the age of 26, the Babylonians came, 
and they took off a select group of Israelites and they carried them off into captivity. Jerusalem hadn't fallen yet and the southern kingdom hadn't fallen yet. It was still 11 years away. But they did take this select group and Ezekiel was among them. As a young man, right on the cusp of becoming and fulfilling what he believed to be his destiny, obviously born into the priestly clan, he finds himself in a refugee camp in Babylon. And I don't know, if I had been Ezekiel, I would have kind of been of the attitude to say, well, that's gone. I ain't doing that. That's never going to happen. And then God taps him on the shoulder and says, I want you to be the voice of the Lord to these people who have been placed in exile. And if I'm Ezekiel, I'm like, yeah, no. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you pick up on this, but when there's more of you in the room and you're in a better mood, I preach better. <laughs> so if I'm having a bad week, just, just saying. Because there is a certain exchange that goes on in this process. And, you know, after many months of just talking to that camera back there, you know, I got really good at imagining how excited you were at home. <laughs> I was making stuff up in my head. There were people praying around the sofa at the end of my sermon. They were going to their next door neighbors and telling them the stories. Now you're here and I can see you. I still think you people online are really excited about all this. But imagine Ezekiel, because that's got to be true, that a part of what's happening in that exchange, and, and now he's speaking to people who are hopeless. They're devastated. They're not excited about life in general. Everything they love and hold dear has been taken from them. They're depressed. They're overwhelmed. And Ezekiel now, because the, the, the southern kingdom hasn't fallen yet, he spends an, the word of the Lord for an enormous amount of time is warnings. I mean, that's just what you want to tell a bunch of discouraged, frightened people. Stop it. And he warns and he warns and he warns and he warns. And eventually, the southern kingdom does fall. And there's this, there's this sense in this writing of Ezekiel of this kind of attitude and spirit of doom. And it's just sort of a sense that there's no hope and there's nothing going on. And so God gives Ezekiel this very unique vision. It's recorded for us in Ezekiel 37. Just listen to what happens. The hand of the Lord was on me. And he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and he set me in the middle of a valley, and it was full of bones. And he led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were dry. And he asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. And then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin, and I will put breath in you, and you will come to life, and then you will know that I am the Lord. So, so he takes Ezekiel out, and he says, I'm just going to give you a vivid image of what's happening to you emotionally, what's going on in the hearts and minds and the thoughts and feelings and the spiritual journey of my people. It is a valley of dry bones. I'm guessing that there are a few people right here who are experiencing some dry bones. You, you just feel it in your spirit, in your body, in your heart, in your mind, in your spirit, in your home, in your family, in your relationships. In fact, if I just were to say to you and challenge you <laughs> to say right now, whether you're at home or you're right here in the room, where? Where is that valley of dry bones for you? In your emotions? Because some of us are wrung out. We're not feeling emotions that are positive. We're feeling mostly emotions that are negative. And we do that consistently. We've been doing it consistently for a few months now. Maybe a couple years. Is it in your thoughts? Because there's a, there's a sense sometimes that when we talk about change, which by the way we're talking about today, unblocking change, that when we talk about change, that, that by experience and perspective... Change always is for the worse and not for the better. And maybe there's just been some layers of your thoughts that are always focused on fear or what's getting worse. 
Maybe it has to do with spiritual life. Maybe if you said, here's, here's a vivid description of my spiritual life right now, dry bones. I mean, on the scale of human endeavor, you don't get much lower than this. I suppose you could go one step beyond this, and you could just be, you know, dust to dust, and ashes to ashes, but dry bones is way down there and way more impressive of a visual than just dust. I mean, he's taking him around and going, I just want you to get a, I just want you to walk among the dry bones. And then he breathes on the bone. The, the Holy Spirit breathes on the bones and they start to rattle. This is a freaky story. I mean, I don't know about you, but if I'd have been there, I'd have been like, yeah, that's no. No. And the bones begin to rattle. And tendons start to form. And the things that are scattered and broken and in such disarray organize themselves. And the right bones get on the right bodies. <laughs> and they start to form together into skeletons. Have you read this story? I'm not making this up, by the way. <laughs> I'm not embellishing this story. And then muscle begins to form on the frame. And then skin begins to cover the muscles and there is a mighty army of God. That's, that's a pretty vivid journey from hopelessness to the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit breathed over what was once dead and is now alive. On a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being the lowest, 10 being the highest, what would you rate your level of cynicism? On a scale of 1 to 10, the Scripture says, Ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open." We're, we're doing this series on the unblocking of the Holy Spirit. On the reality that most of us live at a small percentage of our capacity at our spiritual life. And on a scale of 1 to 10, how cynical are you? Now, before you answer, Let me read to you a couple of definitions about cynicism. I didn't make these up. This is taken from the Oxford Dictionary. Cynicism is an attitude characterized by a general distrust of the motives of others. Scale went up a little. A cynic may have a general lack of faith or hope in people may believe that people are wrongly motivated by ambition, desire, greed, gratification, materialism, goals, and opinions that the cynic perceives as vain, unobtainable, or meaningless, therefore deserving of ridicule and admonishment. It's an inclination to believe that people are motivated purely by self-interest. Yourdictionary.com has a little more flowing definition. It's an emotion of jaded negativity or general distrust of the integrity or professed motives of other people. Cynicism can manifest itself by frustration, disillusionment, and distrust in regard to organization, authorities, and other aspects of society, often due to previous bad experiences. Cynics often view others as motivated solely by disguised self-interest. On a scale of 1 to 10, how cynical are you? Because here's the thing that happens in cynicism. In cynicism, we lose our ability to ask and seek and knock. We become disillusioned about life, disillusioned about the world. And listen, if you haven't been keeping up, cynicism is what is being sown into the culture of our world. You cannot turn on the news. You cannot follow anybody. You cannot get on Facebook. You cannot get on Instagram. You cannot go on anything where what is being sown is not this level of cynicism, where we are questioning and admonishing the motives of other people, even though we don't know what they are, even though we've never asked the right questions, even though we've never explored. We just believe that behind that, and that goes on and on, politics, business, people with money, people without money, 
organizations. Cynicism. 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 And cynicism steals away our desire for change. Steals away our asking and seeking and knocking. It's a valley of dry bones. Where's the hope? Jesus lived in a culture of cynicism. He came to a world of cynicism. You think we're cynical now. It's always, I always marvel, you know, because if you read a little history and you think right now is a really bad time to be alive. I mean, if you want to go back to medieval times, to the feudal systems, if you want to go back to the first century when great empires dominated the world, where there were the haves and the haves nots, where really the powerful exploited the weak, there have been some really horrible times in human history. Jesus lived in one of those times when the Roman Empire dominated the world. And we talk about the Roman Empire like it's highly enlightened. Oh, yeah, there was a, a judicial system. There were civil rights. There were all kinds of good things going on within the culture of Rome, but only if you were Roman. And if you weren't, <laughs> you, were, you were just fuel for the fire. You were just feeding the machine. And Jesus happened to live in one of those places that had become dominated by Rome, where Rome was crushing the life out of the culture and the people. And along came Jesus. And Jesus came along and he acknowledged a couple of things. He acknowledged, number one, that the culture was cynical and the culture was broken and the culture was hurting. But he also acknowledged that Judaism was broken and hurting and that it was also exploiting the people. And so the faith and the religion had become devoid of the Spirit of God. It was all about legalism. It was all about, you know, measuring people by how well they were performing. And it was stealing the life. In, in Matthew 21, Jesus says to the Pharisees, You have loaded burdens on the backs of people that are crushing the life out of them. And you are doing nothing. You have not lifted a finger to relieve them of this pressure. So, so Jesus comes and he talks about the culture is not giving them hope. But he talks about the fact that their faith is not giving them any hope either. And he starts to speak this simple story of new life and rebirth. Redemption. Hope. He suggests to them in simple stories about farmers. Little stories about wine and wineskins. He suggests to them that they could bypass the whole system, that it didn't matter so much about Rome, and it didn't matter so much about what was happening in the empire, and it didn't matter so much about Judaism, and it didn't matter what the Pharisees said, and it didn't even matter what the old law said. In fact, that illustration about wineskins is saying that old wine cannot hold the vitality of this new wine. If you put this new wine of hope and rebirth and new life, and you put it in the system of the old Judaism, it'll burst, it, it'll explode. And then the system catches up with him. And it grinds him up. Now John has been telling us this story with the intent of getting us to this point in the narrative. He started at the beginning to, to tell us where we were going. And now we're here. And we come to this devastated people who have been given this promise of new life and new birth. And the hope. And now in chapter 20, we, we've got Jesus dead and buried. We open chapter 20 then with these words on Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, don't you love that? I mean, you think that's just telling you what time of day it was, but that's not all it is. Very early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. And she saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, that's John. And said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb, and both were running. But the other disciple outran Peter, and he reached the tomb first, and he bent over, and he looked at the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. 
And then Simon Peter came along behind him, and he went straight into the tomb. And he saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. And the cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. And finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside, and he saw and believed. And now he gives us this note. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. So, so Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene, and then at the end of this day, very quickly now, that's, that's verse 9, verse 19, same chapter, we have this little vignette. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now, there's several things that I notice in this story that I think matter a lot. Number one, that you and I, if we're going to unblock change, we need to admit our fear. I love that John starts telling this story by acknowledging that, because if I'd have written the story, I would have said, and the disciples were faithfully gathered together, praying and singing hymns in the upper room, awaiting their confident presence of Jesus Christ. That's not what he says. They were hiding for fear of the Jewish authorities. They were scared. They were terrified. And I think it's a really good place to start when we think about change. We ought to go ahead and just get it out. Just go ahead and admit it. You know what I observe in our culture right now? There's something going on, but what's really going on is what's next. What we're really afraid of is what's next. What does this mean? I don't know. I don't think you know. But we have a lot of people that are prognosticating. Amen? <laughs> Trying to read the tea leaves and put it all together and figure out what's next. That's what we're really scared of. We're scared of what's next. What a great place to start. Fear is a shortcut that we get to experience all of the anxiety without ever having to go through the circumstances. <laughs> Amen? That's why Jesus says, don't borrow from tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough worries of its own. Just live right over here. Just stay right here. Stay in your lane. And, and the reality is for all of us, you know, we ought to just gather it all up and just admit it. We, we got issues. Every one of us in this room got issues. We got issues all up in our head. We got issues in our emotions. We got issues in our spiritual life. We're uncertain. We don't know what to do. We've been disappointed. People have let us down. We've looked around at our culture and our world. Listen, you guys might not know this, but the scripture says where there is no vision, people perish. Literally, it says where people are not looking up to God, where they start looking around at each other, all kind of bad things happen. And I don't know if you realize what's happened, but in the last 20 months, man, our gaze has slipped way down. We are constantly looking at each other and measuring what's going on with you. Oh, I don't like you. You did what? Oh, no. Uh-uh. And we've gotten shortcuts now. <laughs> now we can, we can identify people and their persuasion from a long way off. Can I get an amen? Amen. We would get very little exercise except jumping to conclusions. And folks, it ought not be. We ought to be able to go ahead and just say it out loud. Let's get our fears out there. Let's get our disappointments out there. Let's clean some stuff out. Let's pile it up. I love that at this climactic moment of Jesus entering the room, John thinks to tell us that they were standing there in fear on the brink of what was the greatest breakthrough in all of human history in all of creation, in all of divine history, on the brink of that moment, what are they doing? They're hiding in a little room, scared, just like we are. Sometimes when I'm doing premarital counseling and I'm talking to a couple, I say to them, I want you to imagine you've just been given a brand new house. It's all nice. And you don't have very much stuff to put in that house. It's going to be nice and simple. Let me encourage you to not fill up the closets and stuff junk under the bed. Keep your house clean. And there's a lot of us that have lived a few miles and we're like, you know, I, got all, I don't even want to look in the closets of my inner world. There's things in there that will eat me alive. Amen? 
And if we're going to embrace change and unblock it, we're going to have to go, you know what? Blah. I am scared. I don't like it. I don't know about human beings. I don't know what it all means. I don't get it. But I know that I'm called to be something more than a cynic. I'm called to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And these two things don't coexist well. And I'm instructed to ask and seek and knock. And I want to do less worrying and a less fearing and a lot more asking and a lot more seeking and a lot more knocking. But I'm going to have to own where I am. This is really where I am. My prayer is that the Holy Spirit would work in you in these next few days and weeks and would start to say, you know, that's a fear. That's just a fear. It's not knowledge. I don't know something. It's fear. It's fear. I want to call it what it is and see it for what it is. Number two. On that evening of the first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and he said, peace be with you. Can you breathe that in? We're going to have to embrace peace. We're going to have to admit our fear, but we're going to have to embrace peace. And that's a choice we make about what we deeply believe about the world and the God who runs it. Because I do believe that as we have lived in our fears and they're kind of stuffed in all the places in our life and our story, that causes something kind of anxious in us. And it never lets us really settle into this space and where we breathe in the peace of God. But God is in control. And somehow to, and here's what's so funny to me is, did we ever think that stuff was going to give us peace? Did you ever think the government was going to give you peace? I mean, maybe on a good day. Did you ever think that human relationships were going to give you peace? There's a passage in Proverbs that says, where there are no oxen, the trough is clean, but with oxen come great gain. That means where you don't mess around with oxen, you don't have a lot of stuff to clean up. But as soon as you get oxen, things will get messy. But there's a lot of good stuff about oxen. That's how human relationships work. If you want to have a simple life, don't be in relationship with people. You can have a lot more peace. Amen? Live clean. <laughs> But with relationships come great gain. So deal with the messiness of it, but just know that the messiness of it is a part of it. It's when you start expecting that there's no messiness, that you're going to get peace from it. That's like having children. I'm going to, you know what to make our life better? Let's have children. <laughs> It'll be wonderful. We'll just skip around and play, and they'll come, and they'll say, I love you. <laughs> and we'll say, Go clean your room. And they'll say, okay. <laughs> and, and then the reality begins to sort of seep in. And we're like, whoa. I don't know. I had this conversation this morning. Some grandparents over at Pasadena, and they were, brought their grandkids today. And they, go, they came in, and they looked like they'd been in a fight. <laughs> and they said, she said to me, we made it. And I said, there's a reason God gives children to young people. Because <laughs> it's hard. But why do we ever expect that this was going to be the source of our peace? This is not the source of our peace. And he breathed on them and said, peace be with you. And we're going to have to quit breathing in this stuff. And we're going to have to start breathing in this stuff. We've got to embrace it. It's not just going to get into us unless we breathe it in, unless we focus on it, unless we let it happen. Yes, the world, yes, my fears, yes, but you are the God of the universe. And you're not surprised by any of this. And you can breathe life into dead bones. You, you get what's going on here? There's a dead man standing in the middle of the room in front of them. Their hopes died with him. Now he's standing there. I know you're afraid, but peace be with you. Now look what happens. 
If we're going to embrace change, we can't over-spiritualize things. Next he says, come and put your hands in the nail prints and touch my side. And I think Jesus is saying, listen, you think I'm a phantom. You think the only place I'm working is somewhere up in your head and in your spirit. Let me tell you, I am working in the physical world. This is a physical body that was dead and is now alive. Why don't you come over here and touch it just so you get this message? Just so you don't walk out of here later and go, I think I saw Jesus. It happened in my brain. It happened in my spirit. Jesus is like, oh, no, no. It did not happen in your brain, and it did not happen in your spirit. It happened in this physical world. You put your hands right here, and you touch this. And don't you over-spiritualize change. Because change doesn't just happen in our perspective, though it should happen there too. Change actually happens in the physical world. And Jesus is just saying, listen, I don't want you to misconstrue what the miracle is. That which was dead, physically dead, is now physically alive in the very real world. Yes, there is a spiritual thing going on behind it. But don't forget this, because I think as Christians, we've copped out. And we've started to go, well, I'm sure God's doing something good somewhere. Well, I'm sure he is too. But he'd like to do it here. And he'd like to do it with us. And he'd like to do it in your home and in my home. And in our lives. In the very real world in which we live. And so he says to them, come touch me. Just come and take yourself out of wherever your brain might take you and get over into this because from now on you will remember this touch. You will always remember this physical moment in which it wasn't the faith became sight. And it was this moment that changed everything. Number four. Everybody doing okay? Yeah. Now he says this. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you as the Father has sent me. Now I'm sending you. So he immediately transitions into, oh, and by the way, you've got a mission to accomplish. You've got a purpose. I know you're afraid. Let me breathe peace on you. This is where you find peace. I'm not talking about some spiritual phantasm. I'm talking about the physical reality of how the world works. The things that were dead are now alive. Now you get out there and go build the kingdom. Go build it. In fact, what Jesus has already told us, he's told us in, in chapter 5, I just do what the Father has told me, and now you're going to do what the Father tells you. We're just going to, you're going to carry on what I, in fact, he tells us later on in chapter 15, he says, listen, you're going to do greater things than I've ever done. Because I'm going to go to the Father, and he's going to send you the Holy Spirit, and you're going to be empowered in a way that's unbelievable. You're just going to go change the world. Are we? Are we more hiding <laughs> In fear, or are we more getting about the mission? Don't you love the, the other gospel? This, this is John, by the way. This is John's story of the gift of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't tell us about the upper room back in Jerusalem. The, the other gospel writers fill that in for us. This is his moment. But don't you love the other gospel writers that they record the ascension of Jesus? I love this. This is so human. So Jesus ascends into heaven, and what, are they, what is everybody doing? They're watching him go. And, and you know, and when you, I don't know, don't you project that when Jesus got back into heaven, that they were all like high-fiving, they're like, way to go, that was awesome. You special effects people, you crushed it. I mean, he just floated up, he just floated up, he floated up and disappeared from their side. It was so cool. And then they're all up there just celebrating this moment, this awesome, Jesus is back in heaven, woo! And then somebody looks down and goes, uh, they're still looking up here. They're just standing there looking up here. I mean, it's like a relay race. It's like Jesus is down there, you know, he's like, okay, 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 here's the baton. <laughs> okay, go. Oh. And they're just standing there holding the baton. I mean, don't you, he's probably saying, oh, that's not how you run the race. You are losing. And finally they go, well, okay, we're going to have to get some angels to go down, I guess. And so two angels go down. They go, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into heaven? This same Jesus that you saw ascended into heaven will come again in like fashion. Go to Jerusalem and wait for the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Go! Go! And aren't we still there? Don't we come Sunday after Sunday staring into heaven instead of going? 
Instead of building, inviting, spreading, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, the hope of rebirth, the hope of redemption, the hope of genuine change, what comes out of our mouth, we get to decide. We get to decide if we're going to breathe the kingdom of God and the peace of God and the grace of God, or if we're going to breathe all of that other stuff. And we do it moment by moment and conversation by conversation. The kingdom of God is not built in some fantastic way. It's built because the people of God go as his hands and his feet, and they are the salt of the earth and the light of the world, ambassadors of reconciliation, as though God is making his appeal through us. And the kingdom's not waiting to come. It's waiting on us to escort it into existence. And we can. We can. We can't. The kingdom of God is so much greater than what any of us can imagine because it's all pocketed away in all of these little things. I hear this in our culture today. The world would be better off without the church. The church is corrupt. Amen. You know why it's corrupt? Human beings. There's some other really pristine organizations in the world like One of the last people that told me this was, a, was an actor in Hollywood and said to me, we ought to tear down these structures that allow for such corruptions. And I was like, well, if the shoe fits. <laughs> but it is corrupt because human beings are involved. But it also is incredibly good. And we forget this part. That if tomorrow the church of Jesus Christ ceased to exist, health care around the world would fall apart. Children would not be fed. Advocacy programs would die. We have no idea of the power and intimacy of the kingdom of God alive on earth because we are ignoring it. Because we're allowing it to be pushed underground. This is not something we ought to be ashamed of, folks. It's something we ought to embrace. I, I just... just Just as a tiny example, Scott talked about it last week. This week, in fact, right now, it's nine hours later over in Eswatini. They're getting ready for bed right now. Tomorrow morning, children are going to show up at a child care center, and they're going to eat because of you. Because you gave money to make that. And that dollar went right over there and bought rice and beans. And it pays a couple of workers who are going to build a wood fire in the morning and they're going to cook rice, and they're going to cook beans, and they're going to feed kids. And kids are going to eat the one meal of the day, and they're going to cover up half of it, and they're going to take it home to their brothers and sisters so they get something to eat too. That's the intimacy of the kingdom of God alive on earth. Don't you tell me what's wrong with it. Tell me what's right with it. Because there's so much right with it. Number five, we accept the mission is number four. Number five, we let the dry bones live. And he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. You can hardly, you can hardly, you know that, that John began this story with the story of Genesis. He retold Genesis. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. Here he is at the end and he's saying right at the end of the story and he breathed life into them. Just like he breathed life into Adam. Just like he breathed life into the dead bones. Just like he breathed life into Jesus Christ. What was dead is now alive. And for you and I, listen, that is our great hope. That is our great hope. It's not about how I feel. It's not about what I think. It's about me embracing this reality. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and give me the wisdom. Give me the grace. Help me to walk every moment, to breathe every moment in that reality. This stuff is real. The fear is real. The life is real. But you've come that we might have life and have it to the full. The thief comes to steal and to kill. I don't have to live over there. I am, and I do, but I don't have to. I'm invited into something else. Where in your life do you need some dry bones to be brought back? Let's invite the Holy Spirit to do that. He's told us this. Nothing in life can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Not life, not death. Not things present, not things to come. Not powers, not principalities. Principalities means not evil spirits or spiritualizing things that sneak around in the dark of night. None of that stuff can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Where do you need 
your dry bones to live. We're going to close. And as we pray this prayer and as we sing, the band comes back. I just want you to think about where you want to breathe in the Holy Spirit. And as we close out this series, I, I want you to take this with you. He's with you. He's with you. He's with you. He's with you. Ask. Seek. Knock. Don't let cynicism steal away our optimism about life and the future, about who we are and who we're called to be and how he wants to change the world. And don't buy into this thing about some social justice organization is going to fix the world. Listen, the hope of this planet is Jesus Christ. The unselfish reality. Listen, the unselfish reality of just this. I'm not in it for any other thing except the good of another human. I'm not in it for one other thing. And it's not because I'm good. It's because that's the example that he set for me. And that's the life he gives me. It's not about me. It's not about what I get out of this. This is about unselfishly laying down our lives for others. Listen, there's not another, there's not another organization in the world that can talk about that. Just this church of Jesus Christ. Let's go be those people. Let's go be those people. Let's not leave that responsibility to somebody else. God, would you help us? We need you. You have gifted us with this story that is so powerful and vivid and real and true. Dry bones live again. The rattle comes and the tendons form and disorganized things get organized, not in any way, but the right way. And we'll just admit it. Our culture, our world, our politics... Our church, there's a lot of dry bones. There's a lot of disarray. We're inviting you to come. We're inviting you to breathe your breath over the chaos and the death and speak life and healing, redemption. We're asking you to empower each of us to, to admit the fear and pull it out and call it what it is and say over it what it means and, and just give it to you. And we do it right now. All over this room, online, we surrender fears to you. Anxiety, doom, depression. Breathe on the dry bones of our thoughts, our emotions, our spiritual life, our community of faith, our culture, our world. Let us be light. Let us be salt. Let us be ambassadors of reconciliation. Let us welcome your peace pray that we'd breathe it in. And I pray as we sing in response to your word, but these words would not just be the words of a song, but, but the cry of our heart and the cry of our soul. Hear us as we pray. We humble ourselves. We invite your Holy Spirit to bring genuine change. We welcome it. And we pray it in Jesus' name. And everybody said together, amen. amen. Let's stand together and let's respond to the word. And all the earth will shout your praise Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing Great are you, Lord And all the earth will shout your praise Our hearts will cry, these
So we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great Sunday now.